Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Oh, hi, Podmanity. Oh, hi, Michael. All right, I guess it's another exciting episode of Double Feature happening here. Michael, uh, you are a podcast host. Today we're doing The Room and The Happening. Well, why are we making people watch these movies? We're, it's actually for a brilliant reason. We do have a good reason, actually. You, you There's a very legitimate with, reason. You came up with the reasons. I just came up with the movies. That's usually how that goes. So I think the idea is we could uh, we can contrast these two movies, which are bad, by the way. If yeah. you're not aware of what um, The Room and or The Happening are, they're both terrible films. And people, you know, they look back through the films we've done on the show, and I think they have this idea that we do terrible films on Double Feature mm-hmm. because a lot of times they're obscure, or, but we love the movies yeah, we do. just about... 99 percent 62 percent of the one. time god i fucking hate these films already uh but the room and the happening are both terrible films yes however one of these films has a sort of cult appeal it's celebrated people enjoy going to it and the other one has only been out it, not even as long uh but people have already forgotten about mm-hmm. it they hate it it's it's the happening i'm right. describing Uh, The Happening came out, people saw it, and they immediately forgot about how bad it was, and no one ever talked about it again. It was like there was uh, some sort of mutual agreement among, you know, I don't know, everybody who saw the the film. Mm -hmm. They just all decided, we will never speak of this occurrence. It's just one of those things in nature that we'll never really understand fully. I was hoping it would be one of those things in nature that never fucking goes away, but I appeared to be the only person who enjoyed it, uh, who enjoyed it that way. So we're going to look at those back to back, obviously. This is normally where we would put the sort of spoiler warning. I don't really think we're going to... I guess we'll spoil these movies. We're definitely you know going to spoil the room. It doesn't fucking matter. That's true. It does not matter. If you haven't seen these movies, if you have information about what happens in the film, will not change your viewing experience at all. Why don't you just listen to the show even if you haven't seen the movies? Does Sounds that, like that sound agreeable? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in saying that, what we're going to do is uh, something a little bit different. Yeah. Occasionally we'll mix up the show to do something like a kill a palooza or a marathon or something. But with these two movies, we do have a question at Mm -hmm. the end. The question is one has cult status and one was just as fucking awful and does not. Right. And why is that? It's kind of an examination of, of the difference between bad and so bad it's good. That is precisely the point. And also, I don't think either of these movies warrant the usual 20 minutes. Yeah, absolutely not. I just don't. No I, way. We could talk for 20 minutes about no. them, but they don't deserve it. So we'll give them shorter conversations. And then at the end, where we would usually wrap up, uh, we'll talk a little bit first about answering right. that question. Uh, this that will question. probably affect your little chapter menu that we that have will affect the chapters. To our podcast. Yeah, so if you get tired of hearing us describe one of the movies or the other, uh, you can just jump right to the end. Maybe you the anticipation is killing you. You need to know the answer to the question now. I'm not sure we have the answer to the question, but you know what? We made an effort. We watched the two back to back, and we'll see if we figured anything out. Now, I have to admit, you you know I have a love of cult cinema. Yeah. The Room is something that has been lingering on the, um, you know, it, this kind of goes without saying, but both you and I have a pretty long list of films that we have to watch. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. Do you keep an actual list for I that? Do. Do you kinda, I do. I keep a physical list. Yeah, I'm the same way. I keep a list every time someone tells me I should see something or we get fucking emails from people all the time. And it goes somewhere in that list. I sort of throw it in a, in a vague priority. The Room has been on there for what seems like years now. Mm-hmm. And um, I kind of knew it. We mentioned it before. I think in talking about probably Repo or Rocky Horror yeah. or something, how the Music Box, the local uh, independent theater in Chicago, mm-hmm. or one of them, I should right. say, has been showing The Room all the time. And it is very much in the vein of Rocky Horror that, sure. they, that they show it. It's so In so much as throwing stuff at the screen. Sure. So it's one of those movies I've always been meaning to get to, but did not actually see until today. And I was not really prepared for... What was uh, so? Here's the thing that blows my mind. You know, I hadn't seen it. It's been around. It turns out it's been around since 2003. Yeah, I was not well, aware of that. It was made at all. in 2003. Okay, all right. Which I mean, a lot of people who aren't familiar with how films usually work when they're not produced by Michael Bay, mm-hmm. 
particularly independent films, will do a festival circuit, and you won't even hear about them until two years, three years after they're mm-hmm. completed. Well, especially a film like this that was self-financed. Right. You know, you pay for the movie yourself as the creator, and then you try and farm it out. You try and get a, uh, a studio to pick it up to buy it and release it for you. So this movie was so god-awful, it kind of sat in limbo for a while, and eventually, being so bad it kind of gained that cult status. People picked up on it and said, this is so fucking awful, you have to see it. So for people who haven't seen The Room, and I think that might be a lot of people, Mm -hmm. you're a little bit more schooled in this than I am. slightly. So I figure we could give a little bit of background information that might be redundant, and then we could kind of drill in a little bit deeper. Sounds like a plan. So what the fuck is The Room then? The Room is a film that is, it has been hailed as... The Citizen Kane of bad movies. You know, it's funny you use that. I've uh, I've heard that before. Several people yeah. have pitched it to me as that. And and it's because, one, it is one of the worst, best, worst movies ever made. Mm-hmm. But I think the more The proverbial so, so bad, it's good. Exactly. But I think more importantly, the analogy is drawn because Tommy Wiseau, who plays Johnny in the film, um, not only stars in the film, but he's also responsible for the writing, the production, the direction... Among other things. I he mean, is, in he, this comparison, Orson Welles. Exactly. He is, it is his film in, in every respect. So I can see why people who listen to our show have been trying to get us to watch this, because we talked about auteur theory a little bit. We talked about you know liking these, um, these film creators who are at the helm of what right. they're doing, who write and direct and maybe score and sometimes act in their, their movies right. as well. So Tommy Wiseau sets out to make what he thinks is going to be a groundbreaking dramatic film, right. which starts out as a story of best friends, Johnny and Mark, mm-hmm. and the trials and tribulations that women kind of impose on yeah. their world. The trouble their that women world. cause. The film comes out, it's a total wreck. Yeah. It's absolutely awful from the standard film standpoint. Tommy Wiseau is not, he does not falter. Mm-hmm. Instead, he he starts saying, yes, it was a black comedy. I did it on purpose. It's all been a joke. Yeah. There are interviews where people around and involving the film, not just Tommy, but also actors, talk about it being a serious endeavor that kind of flopped. Mm-hmm. But since then, Tommy has kind of rallied that this was a joke the whole time. Right, Even right. the actors didn't know about it, maybe. And that's only been since the cult acclaim of, of you know, the, the Citizen Kane of Bad Movies title. And it, it really is. It's, it's a total wreck. So and, you're saying that once he realized that the only way people would see this movie is as the worst movie ever created. Right. Then that was the goal from right. day so, one. So he, he got the edit back of this thing. He looked at it and said, this is a masterpiece. He put it in cinema, saw the reaction and then decided, right. uh, yeah, you guys are right. It was totally exactly. a joke. Yep. Exactly. You can see that sincerity in the movie as you're watching it. You know, it, when you see a disaster like this, and that was my question with the happening when I saw it, because you saw it in a big group of people. I did. I didn't get to drag anybody to that. I saw it by myself. You're better off. And, um, and I thought, wow, this has to be an elaborate hoax or something. And when you see a movie like The Room... The same thing kind of rings in your mind. You go, is this an elaborate hoax? A movie like this almost needs to be concocted to be such a disaster. There's a couple points. I mean, there's the the 90s era sort of boys to men soundtrack. Right. The, um, With the snapping. Yeah, snapping it's the snaps and, and the wind chimes. Every track. Yes. And every time two characters are fucking, it kicks in pitch. You know what it reminds me of? You remember Machete? I do remember Machete. Yeah, and they poke fun at that. You know, every time that kind of porno soundtrack kicks in, you know, that's making fun of it. And in this movie, there's there's that dead sincerity to that, even to the fucking wind. The wind chimes are what get me. Mm -hmm. Every single time I hear those things, it's just, I can't imagine anyone was in it. It's the same thing for the movie, but for music. I try and imagine that little production studio. I try and imagine people in there laying down the final mix and they're going, you know what we need here? is another, another slow stroke of the wind chime. It's just fucking obnoxious. It's more likely just a patch on their old-timey synthesizer. Yeah, I don't even know, because synthesizers are odd like that, too. You have some cheesy 70s stuff, which has its purposes. You have the great synthesizers of the 80s. And then there's this narrow thing that happened, you know, 1989 to 1992. Not just in synthesizers, but in that, that whole breed of music, where... Um, 
you know, it was stuff like Boys to Men, right? Mm-hmm. It was that awful early 90s pop that just disappeared, much like The Happening did. Yeah. People don't even want to think about it. And rarely do I pretend to know anything about music. I'm all right with everybody's musical taste because I listen to four bands or something. I I have no musical taste of my own. So if people ask me about music, I don't claim to be an expert on that. I will say definitively that 90s era pop slash R&B, whatever you want to call that, is the worst thing ever recorded audio-wise ever in the history of man. I don't think it gets any worse than that. Let's get back to that sincerity, though, because that's something that um, that I enjoyed a lot about the movie. It's not very often that you see a, a popular, a successful, I guess you could call the room successful. Oh, yeah. I sure. mean, that becomes a hard it question. Is, well, because if, if, you're looking at, if you're looking at success to be people knowing about it, people watching it, acclaim and financial success, then right. yes, both of these films, mm-hmm. surprisingly. You know, the room, you see it and it's sincere and it got success for a reason other than it wanted it. And most of the time we see something you know, it's a throwback movie. It's something I mentioned, Machete, but uh, a movie that celebrates that kind of time and place in cinema, or that has a nod and a wink. I know you're a huge fan of Shoot 'Em Up, yeah. Another movie that Absolutely. kind of pokes fun and does cheesy things, but is a is a good action movie mm-hmm. in and of itself. Rarely do you see that become popular. You know, in the way we talked about Repo. Repo kind of knew as it was being made. You know, they cast Paris Hilton. Right. They knew that they were getting themselves into that what-the-fuck territory and that people would have a Rocky Horror-esque time with it. Sure. Rocky Horror is another good example, too. You know, we didn't look at that a lot um, back then when it was on the show, but we could have how much of that they knew would be funny and how much just once it happened, they looked back and said, oh, wow, that was a mistake and people enjoyed it. I always think of like the Ed Wood stuff, right? Yeah. Ed Wood was just such a sincere guy, really thought he was making great stuff, and people look back on it in kind of a kitschy way now. Russ Meyer, also another name where we see that stuff all the time. We looked it up. Faster Pussycat was another one. Absolutely dead sincere. And The Room is sincere, too. Tommy says now that it is not sincere, that they're, they're having fun with it. At the very least, if he's to be believed, he was having fun with it, and none of the actors were. But Tommy also denies being from another country. Yeah, what's that about? I don't really know. For some reason, Tommy Wiseau... So if you haven't seen the film, Tommy Wiseau, E-A-U, at mm-hmm. the end of his last name, denies being anything less than a true 100% born, like and, born and raised American. That's weird. Which may be the case. Maybe he has foreign parents. Where does that accent come from? What is that he accent? He has such a heavy, heavy accent. He's just all sorts of weird. But for some reason, he did not... And, and I'm worried that he's telling the truth. In which case, what the hell is wrong with him? <laughs> right. Right. Because there becomes a, a point. They talk about this. Uh, Rebecca Watson will probably show up on this show a lot this episode. But uh, she's on a, another show called The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. And they often talk about on there, you know, they have to tackle these issues of uh, conspiracy theorists or people who just have a terrible, awful science. And they're to be ridiculed. Right. They're trying to propagate bad science. They are to be ridiculed. But at some point, some of them, especially in the YouTube age, are mentally deranged. Mm -hmm. And there's an ethical line there where you're making fun of somebody who is on the level and just believes crazy shit because their worldview is uh, fucked up. That's okay. But at the point where they have a uh, a mental deficiency, then you kind of feel like a dick. Right. And I almost wonder if that's what we're looking at with Tommy. You know, maybe something is just a little off in his head. It's a lot easier with the actors because the actors all appear to be completely on the level. Now, I'm curious, as we look at this movie and mock it, just fully mock it, maybe embrace it a little bit as it's wonderful that it was created, but also completely mock it because it is, after all, a terrible film. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the actors? Do you feel sympathetic or are they there to be mocked too? The most clear difference between Tommy Wiseau and the rest of the cast of this film is a paycheck. I feel like Tommy Wiseau went into this... You know, he spent his money to get this film made. His money was going into their pockets. Right. They signed up to act in a film and cash a check. Right. That's, at the end of the day, what they walked away doing. And most of them are first-time actors, right? I I mean, mean, it's not Tommy's fault. They did a poor job. 
none of the actors in the film, except for maybe what was his name, like Jimmy R or something, uh, the drug dealer. Yeah. I feel like the drug dealer was the strongest actor in the film. Yeah. That's saying, you know, that's being a little bit forgiving because his character got to do a lot of yelling and brandish and a gun. Left. Yeah. And that gives you a lot more it's acting really hard power. To tell. Sure. It's hard to tell who's doing a good job. But everybody else in the film does a poor job as actors. It's not Tommy's fault. It's not... You know, the viewing audience's fault that they're doing a bad... It's their own fucking fault, but they got paid. So I don't feel bad for them. I feel like they showed up, didn't bring their A game, walked away with exactly what they were promised, and now they're probably just bummed because the film is seen in a different light. But look at something... Go back at something like Rocky Horror. Mm -hmm. Maybe Tim Curry seems like he might have been in on it, but some of the like lower-grade actors probably didn't realize how tongue-in-cheek a lot of what was going on ended up being and i don't think anybody regrets that now yeah i don't know i almost come away from it uh from the reverse direction that you do i look at this in mockery of tommy mentally deranged or not i suppose i should just at the very least be honest about that i can't take that back later when we all find out that he had a piece of his brain extracted by force at birth but the other actors i i feel like maybe they didn't know what they signed up for and that they are in a project now that is impossible to be good in Because, yeah, they're not good in it, but I don't know if that necessarily says they're bad actors. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in The Happening, but I think you can, there's a lot of constraints on you as an actor. Uh, Let's just look at this movie, technical things like, like the fucking lighting, right? They're on soap opera lighting. Everything is really soft and overlit. There's absolutely no definition, except when they fuck up. Particularly in some of the early scenes where the actors move around within the room. Right, where they're not sitting behind chairs, they're actually (laughs) sitting in chairs. Right, and they happen to walk by one of the lights and become entirely uh, too illuminated. Or, you know, the the cheesy lighting scenes, too. But they have these cameras they're using that look like they're from the late 80s. And I don't think you could take the best actor we've seen in any movie we've ever done on Double Feature put them into the room, what would they look like? They would look like a fool too, wouldn't they? Yeah, but they're doing a bad job. It's almost like everybody's cold reading the film. A while ago when I moved, I think we talked about it on the show when it happened, but I moved and I moved in with an actor. Mm -hmm. And so I have a new, I'm not going to say a new respect for acting because I know on the show we've discussed not (laughs) knowing shit about acting. Yeah, right. But we do respect actors. That should definitely be made clear. But I at least understand the power that an actor has over the material they're given. If only because my roommate constantly rehearses and drives me insane day in and day out doing lines and and monologue. I I fucking hate it. It's the worst. (laughs) But I know that you can look at your lines and at least have an understanding of which ones end in a question mark. Oh, yeah. Which ones don't end it. These, These characters seem like... Some of the lines they're saying they've never seen before and the punctuation's missing. So that stuff you clearly can't blame on lighting. That's not the the soft focus, right? you know, or the, I mean, the they thing might... that really gets me about the lighting is the scenes where it's inconsistent. You know, you, you look at one character and it's on the north side, the lights on the north side of their face and the shadows on obviously the opposite end. Look at the other character and it's somehow flipped in the same room, sitting directly across from one another. Oh, God, that stuff just drives me nuts. But okay, so that's obviously not it. However, there are things like editing, for instance. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's possible that I feel like when you do a scene like that, maybe you're trying to get the the temperature a little bit. You're trying to get a feel for what this nut job behind the camera wants you to do. And so he could be telling you things like read that more indifferently or feel like you already know the answer to a question. Act or, with your arms. Yeah, saying, I, probably saying, act saying with your something arms insane in every scene. like that. And maybe those actors do 10 good takes and he just drives them down to be That's worse. That's possible too. I'm just saying I think it's possible that one man is ruining this entire film. It is possible, but I still don't feel bad for the actors. I feel like as an actor, you go in knowing that that's a possibility. You know you're going into the lion's den, right? Yeah, yeah. You're walking in there as a tool for somebody else that can totally just fuck everything up. That's why people like to work with good directors, right? Mm -hmm. That's why someone like Leonardo DiCaprio won't do a Juve Bull movie. Yeah, yeah. Because he knows that Juve Bull has the power to ruin him as an actor no matter how fucking good he is. Or, you know, in that same realm to talk about the Christopher Nolan stuff, that's always what they say about Batman, right? All the actors say, we'll come back for sure, just get Christopher Nolan. 
you know, you start to trust. Well, you trust that his movies are always blockbusters and that they're commercially right. successful Ka-ching. and everyone loves them. You've seen what they do with your performance and you say, I want to work with them again. You know, I trust my acting in their hands, you know, whether it's editing or directing or, or whatever. I guess another reason, you know, I want to have sympathy, but I feel good for them. I feel like it's not their fault. Maybe sympathy was the wrong question there because I can't be too sympathetic. They are actors who otherwise would never have made it. And maybe now they have a small chance of being known because their film has cult popularity. Right. Whether it's any fault of their own or not, they're now in a film that people will see. People will talk about who they are. People will see their face. People will take somebody... I don't remember it's good any, for the careers. I don't know any of the actors' names except mm-hmm. for uh, Tommy Wiseau. That's um, that's my fault. No, nah, it's all right. But I would recognize Mark in another movie. Sure, I would sure. recognize Denny in another movie. So if we're going to call this so bad it's good, oh, what's the worst best part? I really think, for me, the worst best part of the film is is when Johnny comes up onto the roof after being accused of hitting Lisa. Oh, sure, sure. And talking to himself. He's talking to himself, and it's all voiceover. At the very end, he says the, he says the phrase, I did not. Right. And his acting is like so over the top, two fists shaking, yeah, yeah. and like to the clouds, screaming, I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. But the voiceover goes, I did not. And then he goes, oh, hi, Mark. And Mark is sitting in the chair on the other side. You didn't see him. Yeah, there's dubbing all over this movie, too. We didn't hit on that, but it's pretty terrible. Why? What would you say was the worst best part? Well, okay, so just mentioning the stuff outside, I mean, that green screen is yeah. awful. First thing that made me notice it was the lighting, because yeah. the sun doesn't fucking operate yeah. like that. Then there are points where they're close enough to the actors, or maybe the actors were close enough to the screen, or for whatever variables you can see the reflection of the green screen right. on the yeah. actors, and it wasn't color corrected yeah. out. Well, it's because everything's done on the cheap, 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 cheap. Well, that cheap. too. I was going to mention that too. I don't know what... It reminded me of um, Arrested Development, right? where they're all making the chicken sounds, but yeah. none of them sounds like a chicken. And, but everyone's doing cheap, cheap, cheap in here. It's fucking ridiculous. But the scene, I don't know if you noticed it because you were cracking up, but in the second time they do the cheap, cheap, cheap... Uh-huh. It shows the actors that the other actors that are in on it because it's not just Tommy. Yeah. And the guy who plays Mark is like so begrudgingly cheap, cheap, cheaping. Oh, is he really? He's like cheap, cheap, cheap. Uh, like I cheap. can't believe they're making me do this. Yeah, I can't. This reinforces bl- my theory. Exactly. It's like it's like my I I did not sign up for cheap, cheap, cheap. I'm surprised you picked that scene in uh, in particular because my favorite scene and I think probably a lot of people's favorite scenes a scene actually that someone had shown me before we saw it today. Was the flower shop. The flower shop. Oh, my God. So the dialogue between Tommy and the, the woman <laughs> who works at the so flower good. shop. We mentioned stuff being dubbed or whatever. And I don't remember if this particular scene was. But the dialogue, even <laughs> the way it's acted, it's as if they are not aware of each other. Right. They happen to be having two separate conversations. And maybe the guy in audio just mixed up the wrong levels. I mean, of course, that's not what happened because mm-hmm. of their, their interaction there. But he's talking about, you know... He goes in there to buy roses, and oh, I didn't realize it was you. Your later says you're our favorite customer or whatever. Yeah. Oh, hi, doggy. So many things that are wrong with this scene. Uh, the fact that he's in there buying flowers all the time but does not know the price, and then the hi to the dog on the way out, and she's shouting. Oh, God, the whole thing is just such a wreck. If you don't watch this movie at all, at least look up the flower shop scene. In fact, that's probably all you need it to really, understand any of this conversation. pretty much covers all the bases. So here's a question I know I joked to you about, but I'm dead serious about this. I cannot find, we talked about the cheesy score, the 1991 R&B, the, um, the 80s looking camera soap opera stuff. I guess that's probably the same era. Mm-hmm. When they bug the telephone, it's using a cassette on a landline. Uh-huh. You don't see a cell phone through the whole movie. Now, movies tend to date themselves a little bit. I cannot find a piece of technology Cars included in the repetitive establishing shots, I can't find a single piece of technology beyond, say, 1992, 1993. I know this is far out there, but is it possible this movie was made in the early 90s and someone I, sat on it I that long? I don't think so. I think Now, what, you've seen Tommy in person, right? right? 
you saw this at the music box. So he was there doing what, like a Q and A or something? He does something? like a Q and A every time at the music oh, box. Oh, does he? He does it every time. Does he, he just he live comes, outside he comes now? By, he comes by like he's not at doing least anything else. Six times a year. Sure. Oh, actually, that's not true. He's coming <laughs> out a new that film. Bled on Alex. The house that Is bled that, on yeah. Agnes or whatever. <laughs> God. Um, but does he look fifteen years older than no, the movie? No, he just looks fifteen years greasier. Yeah, I guess he wouldn't. He wouldn't right. look any older. Yeah. that man has been that old it's throughout possible. time. Could could we conjecture that perhaps the room is a period piece? That would be kind of brilliant. See, when that shit starts happening, that's when I'm more inclined to believe that what he's saying is serious. You know that he did make a piece of performance art that nobody got. I haven't heard him speak, so the I'm just second, making all this up. Well, I'm going to take your word on whatever you, whatever vibe you got. The second and simpler conjecture, if we're going to go Occam's Razor, because I know we have the happening coming up, oh, God. is that um, he just picked up everything he could from thrift shops and garage sales instead of I guess that makes Best sense. Buy and Radio Shack. He's on a budget. All it takes is one person, perhaps the set designer, to go, we only have two sets. Let's fill it with technology from 1991. But even the, the fucking establishing shot of the streetcar... The continuity is better on here than it was on Lost, you know? Yeah, that's the true. The fact that nobody... I, I don't know. It's just so bizarre to me. Email in if you have an opinion Or if you're this. Tommy Wiseau. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now I just feel like we're giving him more ammunition. Now he's going to go around claiming that he made all of the technology specific to that year for whatever stupid reason he comes up with. God, just so bizarre. So I know one other thing you want to talk about before we move on to the happening is uh, does he deserve credit for his cult status? Yeah. So there's a huge cult appeal to the film. DVD sales have just fucking gone through the roof in the past two years. He's selling out theaters. He's showing up. He's doing public appearances. He has made all the money back. Right. And tenfold yeah. what he put into this film. I'm not sure he deserves it. If you can say that... Essentially, he fucked up. Right. He made a shitty film and turns out everybody thought it was so funny. But mm -hmm. everybody doesn't think it's funny because, wow, what a great, funny, hilarious... It's not death to Smoochie. Yeah. We're not laughing at the jokes. Right. We're laughing at the film. Mm -hmm. We're laughing at, oh my God, how could somebody have thought this would be a good idea? What you're asking, as uh, if, if I'm going to guess your free market status on this, yes. is maybe not so directly... You know, he won the lottery, right? Yeah. He gets to keep the money. Nobody's advocating taking that away from him. Right. But should we feel okay about embracing exactly. his art piece and giving him credit I, for that? I'm conflicted as to whether or not he's allowed to be all, yeah, no, everybody loves me. I'm a celebrity. Right. Right. I feel like that's not fair because he didn't do anything right. He screwed up right. and lucked out. Yeah. And now he, he's everybody's favorite guy. And I'm not sure he earned that. It's something like something like I'm going to keep going back to Rocky Horror because I know tons of the background on sure. it. But someone like Richard O'Brien, mm -hmm. the guy who created Riff Raff from yeah, Rocky yeah. Horror, or Terrence Zedinick from sure. Repo, they did it on purpose. It's their baby. They wrote it. They pulled it up from the right. ground. They always had faith in it that it would find its audience. Yeah, Tommy <laughs> happened didn't. to make something that found an audience that was floated around for almost a decade and found somebody and it wasn't the audience he was looking for he was looking for an audience to take it seriously and adore it as a as a fantastic achievement in cinema sure but instead he found a bunch of fucking people that like to pregame get drunk show up to a midnight showing and throw spoons at a screen and now he's claiming yes i succeeded well you know what's strange about that it kind of reminds me of the you know, the grand era we're in now of internet memes, of the, the double rainbow stuff, the Antoine Dodson stuff. I mean, that, you know, I can celebrate those, those human characters, and mm -hmm. I do enjoy that. But those guys have gotten famous off something they didn't intend to be famous. I think they get it after the fact. Oh, I mean, there's a new internet meme every week, right? Mm -hmm. So us even covering internet memes is completely pointless and maybe a, a bad point of comparison but I feel like whatever the reaction to his movie would have been, he made this movie as a platform for himself. He wanted to, you know, show off his great writing skill and this ability he had to finance something and to create a movie out of nothing. And he just wanted anybody to like it in the same way that the character in the movie just seems like anyone. He just wants anyone to be his friend in the world, anybody to like him. The whole fucking project is about him. So it's no surprise to me that he will latch on to any audience he can get. Right. Another question that kind of provokes then 
is does intention indicate genre? Because we look at this movie now, and what the movie has become is a comedy. You might find this in the comedy section. You will of find it in the wherever. comedy section. It will absolutely not be in the drama section. And that's a little easier when a movie is 30 or 40 years old, and we can categorize it that way. But this is a man who's still living. His intentions, we're going to assume, are unlike his, <laughs> unlike his word, and that he did not intend for this to be a comedy. Yet it is. It is, I don't know if you would necessarily say a dark comedy, but it's a comedy of some sort. Um, there's something a little ironic about it. There's something culty about it. So eliminating the, the genre of cult, because that would just, easy, that's too easy. Would you say that we can call this a comedy? Does intention dictate genre that way? Or is it just the reaction? Does reaction dictate genre? I, you know, I think, I think that because of what it's become, it would have to fall into the category of comedy. Look at it this way. I'm going to answer your question with another question in Uh a second, but first I will be thorough and try to answer it with statements. Take, uh, there's a Seinfeld episode. Not going to talk much about Seinfeld. Never watch much Seinfeld. I do recall an episode of Seinfeld where someone makes out during Schindler's List. Is that a thing? Okay. In that regard, that would then you could put Schindler's List as a romance film. That's obviously not true. It's a date movie, right? Exactly. That's obviously not true. But the thing is, if you were to put the room in the drama section at, say, Blockbuster, by the time the show goes up, there won't be Blockbusters anymore. Right. But just go back into the days of yore when film rental existed. Sure. Um, or the Netflix section, the drama, the drama section Thank on you. Netflix. Nobody would watch it. Nobody would enjoy it. Because if it's in that section, it fails. It's not that. So maybe it's about popular impact. Then. Yeah, you can't have... A, a, if a film is bad as a drama and great as a comedy, you have to put it in the comedy section because you're lying to the dramatic audience that yeah. thinks they're going to see a drama. Right, intention or not. So maybe in that way, it's a lot more about the kind of conversation that comes out of right. it. Right. Not you know just between the two of us or any two individuals, but the popular conversation. The uh, I guess the popular reaction. If everyone would have saw Schindler's List as a date movie, then I guess it becomes a date movie. Right. You know, future date movies will be created based upon that, just as future cult movies will now look back. This will be a point there. This will be something to look at in evaluating, you know, how those movies achieve that status, how that genre is ultimately defined. All right, so now we're going to move into our next film, which is a story about the best friendship between Johnny and Mark. I think we already did that movie. No, I'm talking Leguizamo and Wahlberg. Oh, no. Every now and then we will watch a double feature that we pair together for a simplistic, uh, obnoxious sometimes reason. And I think we have a legitimate question to look at here. But still, we see these parallels. This is the same fucking movie, almost. In fact, I'm glad it's nearly the same movie. Because we can eliminate a lot of the bullshit we would have to talk about otherwise and just examine what makes it different, which is really what we're trying to get at the heart of here. Yeah. Well, this is about the plants being fed up with this world. I think the accent's still carrying over from the last bit on the show. I'm sorry. It's just stuck. The thing is, you don't find out it's about the fucking plants (laughs) being fed up with this world. No, we have to talk about hot dog guy right away, right? Yeah. That's the worst most obnoxious thing in the entire film background and and we really don't do this a lot but just because i told people they didn't have to see the movies Mm -hmm. uh, and i know everybody forgot about the happening i remember back to a day when i didn't watch movies and then three years later i started watching movies daily so it's possible someone listening to the show has never heard about the happening in which case it's a bullshit m night Shyamalan movie um, I want to say right after Lady in the Water, right yeah. before that cartoon thing yeah, he did. Yeah, the fire. The thing that was going to be called Avatar, but yeah. was not. See, I can st- I can talk about that Avatar on the right. show. That's okay. It's probably better than the other one anyways. Don't email us. So the point I was making was that uh, it was a bullshit movie, right? Everybody hated it and no one ever talked about it again. It mm-hmm. was a big deal when it came out, not only for box office reasons, but because of what a critical and popular failure it was. Yeah. A critical failure because it was a big piece of shit and there's nothing redeeming about it. And a popular failure for that reason, but also for the reason that people have come to expect an interesting and unique story and or twist. Twist. They from, expect a twist from M. Night Shyamalan. They certainly do. And it's arguable whether his movies actually have twists or yeah. not after about the third one. It's, it's, it's not a matter of whether or not his films have twists. It's a matter of people expecting that to happen. 
This film is the first one where there is no twist. Turns out there is no twist, and instead there's more of a jerk, where they're tugging you back and forth and not giving you an explanation because that's what they want to end on. I don't know. I almost feel like Lady in the Water was the... I'm not going to debate you on twist. I really don't give a shit. Please continue. The thing about the end of this film is that in the very beginning, they touch on, oh, it's a phenomenon of nature we'll never fully understand. Right. Not going to get into why that's bullshit. Oh my God, I will. But the thing is... They want to end on that. You can tell right there that's the note they want to end yep, on. They're so circling they, around, right? So they can't give yeah. you a definitive answer. Mm-hmm. And I remember that would ruin it. That would ruin it. That would ruin the theatrical <laughs> reach around. Let's right. call it. Yeah. So the thing is, I remember in the theater being pissed off that oh my god, it's actually plants. I can't believe because they dangle it in front of you and keep taking it away. Like it's going to be a misnomer. Exactly. Like that's supposed to be the red herring. Oh god. Um, But what ends up happening is really early on in the film, there's this guy, the M. Night Shyamalan guy who's in a lot of his other films. Yeah. He's got a beard. He's the greenhouse dude. He shows up. First thing he really says, aside from driving the death curse car and wearing the death curse clothes. Oh, it's that guy. Is hot dogs get a bad rep. And then he goes, oh, I think plants are doing it. So the first thing, red lights, flashing, sirens, screaming in my head. That motherfucker's crazy. Yeah. Don't listen to anything he says. He's just going to talk crazy talk. Yep. Everybody in the theater with me that I went with, I went with a large group of people. Everyone at the end of the film, when I was pissed off that it was plants, (laughs) said, dude, they told you right away. The hot dog guy said it was plants. Yep. They told you right away. I remember getting in that car. I was at a, I think it was at a birthday massacre show that day. And I remember getting in the car and they were all bummed about the film. But you were the one who was angry for that particular reason. Right. Just to be clear, no one enjoyed the film. Right. But you happened to have a a specific beef at that point. So in the end, it turns out it was plants the whole time, which they tell you maybe 35 minutes into the film. They never really definitively give you that answer. But by the end, it seems like the only explanation. So when you can't believe the truth because it's coming from a nut, that is uh, the hot dog guy. Right. We will look out for Mr. Hot Dog in future films. I reserve the word hate. Uh, You know, I use it hyperbolically very, very often, but I reserve it for legitimate use. I mean, there's very few films that I actually hate. There's very few films I feel are cynical and evil, and The Happening is definitely one of those films. And maybe that's why, for me, I wanted it to achieve cult status. I wanted that to be the end of what would then become an obscure filmmaker's career, and people to look back and mock it. And they didn't, and it's interesting that they didn't. I mean, I remember why people went to the film, right? Mm -hmm. It's the iconography. It's the deaths. Mm -hmm. You know, you remember the trailer. Yeah, sure. The walking backwards. Walking backwards, talking weird. construction workers. Sure. And I think, and you know, I know we feel a little bit differently about this. There's a lot of stuff for us to disagree on in movies that we both hate as opposed to movies we both love. I think those icons are cool. I think there's stuff that could have been done with them. Those points in the film aren't cool because the film blows. I'm just not on its side, so nothing it could do. It could pull off something brilliantly, and I just don't fucking care because I hate this movie. Mm -hmm. But there are those bits. That's what attracted me to see the film. Not because it's an M. Night Shyamalan film, and I've seen everyone, and everybody's going to see it and talk about it, and I have to know. I know a lot of people see movies for that reason, and that's an all right reason to see movies. Who am I to judge that? But I saw it because I loved those icons. You know, for the same reason that I love a lot of stuff about the slasher movies we see. I love the icons. And when they happen in the movie, I think, wow, that could have been cool if that was treated a little bit better. The movie itself is the, the fucking worst anti-scientific, anti-technology, you know, technology, misinformation spreading, anti-humanist fucking yeah. cynical movie I've ever seen. So much cynicism about the human race, which it's is... awful. It if, drove me crazy. If there's anything you can't be cynical about, it's what? Human progress? Mm-hmm. I mean... Come on, how are you cynical about humanity? Because we're killing plants. Oh, Jesus Christ, man. So I don't know where to start on the misinformation. We should tackle that first. Start with bees. Okay, bees is a really good spot to start because that's what the movie reaches around to. That's what the movie thinks is super fucking important. And it doesn't get the bees 100% wrong. It does because it gets science 100% wrong, but it's okay on the bees. Because it says, well, we don't really know why. And back in 2008... Or, you know, 2006 was really the moment that all that shit started happening with the bees. Uh, We didn't have a very clear indication of why. Well, except here's the thing is in the film, one of the students conjectures, oh, maybe it's a virus. Right. 
And and <laughs> right. Elliot responds with, no, it can't be a virus because it's happening coordinated in 24 different states. There's no way that a virus could all happen at the same time. It's got to be something more inexplicable than that. Yeah, sure. And so to me, that's getting the science wrong because they're stating a fact. The bees are disappearing, which I mean... To start talking about the bees disappearing, that's not true. There's bodies of the bees. That That's where the bee information starts to go wrong. But, oh, by the way, I haven't dropped a... Um, that is total bullshit. But we're going to get to the bullshit. Yeah, so bees are disappearing. What what up with the bees? And so they start speculating up, on that. And uh, that's where we find out that Mark Wahlberg, in addition to being a terrible actor in this film, is also the worst fucking science teacher on the planet. He is the worst Because he's basically teacher. saying the only explanation is that we have to give up on solving the problem. We'll just never know. And kids kind of pipe up and go, hey, what if it's this? And he's like, yeah, that's nice, but turns out the real answer is we'll never know. Stop right. looking into it. Yeah, he kind of goes, a good scientist admits when there's no <laughs> other answers. He keeps saying that to the kids who come up with possibilities. Right. They come up with a possibility, and he goes, you're not being a good scientist. Right. A good scientist will just admit that they'll never know. Oh, God, fuck you, Mark Wahlberg. And then he does that shitty thing that they do about evolution all the time. Right. Where they talk about, you know, it's only a theory, just as gravity is only a theory. Right. And various other theories we've bitched right. about on Double Feature However, before. However, in this film, evolution is tackled a little bit less... Uh, articulately oh. and that they go how could something evolve so fast it can't be evolution <laughs> right. evolution doesn't happen quickly well i believe i believe the um it's the hot dog guy right it's uh, it's either the hot dog guy it's the hot dog guy and the army guy both the the exact quote is we don't know how plants obtain these abilities they just evolve rapidly he's literally saying uh, right after the fucking comma in your sentence man you are explaining how it yeah. happens he's not saying we don't know as a culture as he thinks he's saying the real point of his argument isn't that scientists don't know, science can't understand. It's that he is personally ignorant about how evolution right. functions. It's it's like saying we don't know what 37 and 25 is added together, but it's 62. Right. <laughs> right. So there's a lot of ignorance on display. But to jump back to the bees, because I was totally not done with that. You know, also on the, on the board, and this is where the facts start to go wrong, on the board it basically says, if all the bees disappear in four years, we'll be dead. So this is a, an experiment Double Feature can perform, because in 2006 was the study of the bees. So it's been over four years now. We're still here. Mm. Double Feature 1, happening zero. Bam. But what they're talking about is um, the actual event was, I, I guess it's known as Colony Collapse Disorder. Colony Collapse Disorder. And, uh, and the thing I remember particularly about this, you know, in the time that it happened, I don't know if you remember the, the media hysteria around this, talking about cell phones. Mm. Do you remember any of that stuff? Roughly. Yeah, the idea was that... Well, media hysteria <laughs> and me, we, have, we go di sure. we have different bathrooms. Sure, I like to dive into that. As soon as I hear media hysteria, I'm all over it. I want to know. But uh, it was they were talking a lot about how the cell phones, you know, people using cell phones were causing all the bees to die. And I remember particularly Bill Maher's show, which you're I you're talking still about, like people the since time. they finally have something in their hand hard enough to squash a bee with. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the radiation emitted from cell phones or, or various other theories surrounding cell phones. Different bathrooms. So we were all using cell phones. And the cell phone was killing off the bees. Not squashing the bees. But what he said embodied a lot of the feelings of the time, which is that humanity was leading to its own destruction. It's this sort of hippie self-deprecation nonsense that, you know, humanity will cause its own demise, which I couldn't disagree with more. There are a few sentences in the English language, or any fucking language for that matter, that I could disagree with more that humanity then humanity is is you know going to bring about its own destruction. So I they, think possibly the only way by any stretch of imagination that that could be true is if we last so long that something destroys us before... You get what I'm saying? Oh, no, I absolutely think we could do it. I think things like the atomic bomb make us all take pause and think we could bring about our own destruction. I don't like when modern technology, when something everybody uses, quickly becomes the reason that right. civilization, like the cell phone, cancer. you know, yeah, that the cell phone is going to cause cancer and kill all the bees when science does not back that up. 
Science says that if we drop an atomic bomb, if we drop enough atomic bombs, it will kill everybody. Uh Uh-huh. All right? Or that our tools of destruction, our tools of war could bring about the end of So what you're saying is weapons that kill people could potentially kill people. Yes, but cell phones that make phone calls... But cell phones that make phone calls won't kill people. Won't kill bees, let alone... The bees dying off Unless will have you squash a, them. a chain reaction that ends humanity. It just, it's this thing that shows absolutely no faith in humanity. I have a, a very strong foundation of belief in the fact that humanity has made the earth better. The earth would be fucking dull and boring if we weren't here. And furthermore, humanity has it extended its own life. More dodos. I mean, we live longer. We have easier lives. We have more food. All thanks not to the earth. The earth is trying to fucking kill the us. Norman Borlaug. Thank you, Norman Borlaug. Wow, you are remembering today. Uh, thank you, Norman Borlaug. It's been too long since we thanked Norman Borlaug. But exactly, human beings like Norman Borlaug, who, while there are atomic bombs and weapons of mass destruction... There are people feeding one billion human individuals. Technology we created. The Earth wants those people to fucking die. Arsenic wants those people to die. Natural poisons and gases and chemicals and, toxins, and compounds and you know plants. <laughs> plants. Thank you for bringing this back down to. Uh, I was going to say back down to Earth, but that would have been terrible. Back down to um to our movie today, The Happening. The Earth wants us to die. The Earth is trying to kill us. And humanity is the only reason that humanity itself still goddamn exists. God, it drives me nuts. The old woman in this film, I mean, when they, they the find The last house. old woman. Yeah. Okay, the one, the one who she turns for into me, the first plant zombie. She, for me, um, embodies everything this movie is about. She is anti-people. She is anti-civilization, anti-technology. Her stance, and this is what And she's f- bad at everything. The thing that, when you said this is the message of the film, mm-hmm. this lady is what this film thinks people are, to me it was like, it was obvious that you were stating the anti-technology, anti-people, right. anti-civilization, anti-current events. But the other thing that was really strange, and that most characters don't do when they're being developed in film, is calling out that they're bad at stuff. Remember she said, I'm bad at gardening. I yeah. don't know how to cook. To me, is like, yes, that is what this film is saying about people. It's saying people don't know how to live. Right. They're just going to die. We're all running around, chickens with our head cut off, dicks up our asses, and no one knows what's going on. Eventually, the trees will get the better of us because we're just big, dumb, hairless apes. I love your choice of anatomical function there. But that's the great part, Michael, is that the film doesn't even get this. See, this is what happened. M. Night Shyamalan sits down. He writes this out as a story about, you know, how human beings should be nicer to the earth. And when he writes this character, he doesn't think, what point can I prove with her? He thinks, what would a person who lives in a shack, as I'm implying that people should fucking do, what would that person look like? Well, they probably wouldn't know how to do anything, right? Because that's just how we've seen in movies and what those people are like in real life. He doesn't stop for one goddamn second to go, oh, maybe we shouldn't all just live off of the earth without our technology and without our you know, our drilling and our smokestacks and our but nuclear power. she's the last survivor. <laughs> right. She's the, the last one standing. Yeah, that's the part he wants us to know about. Not the part he accidentally included by trying to build a realistic right. character. He's trying to tell us his, her power. Oh, God, fuck. <laughs> her power is insanity and a strong forehead. That's not where the bad science really begins or ends. You know, we have the point about, um, well, there's that offhanded reference Zoe makes. I guess it's probably to Kitty Genovese, right? I mean, that's the feeling yeah, I got. Sure, How do you, sure. is that probably what that yeah. is? She's talking about, you know, we don't want to be one of those people who sees the thing on the news and we were right there and didn't. Right. Uh, we covered that, right? The, um, the Kitty Genovese thing we covered on two different shows already, but briefly was all of these people who, uh, you know, as the legend purports, as the bullshit non-science, non-fact purports, all of these people stood around watching this woman be what stabbed or yeah, murdered sure. or raped or whatever happens yeah, in that it's, particular it's, version it's that evil is is when a good man does nothing and i hear that but i think what that is more about what the kitty genovese myth is uh more about is that humanity in large numbers that's our natural tendency is to not help people right. if it's not affecting sure. us 30 of them stood around not one did yeah. one thing and i know? think the the odd message that it's kind of showing when you have that horizon line with the gunshots going off in the film when she says that i don't want to be one of those people that just stands by and lets bad things happen i feel like that's the film going see this is how it starts it's saying <laughs> it's saying you don't it's not the people saying well i'm just not going to do anything it's right. all good people going god i don't know what to do 
I've, and it's wrong. I want to make that very clear, but it's saying, oh, you don't always know you're being the guy that lets bad stuff happen. Yeah, right. But there's fucking gunshots over the hill. Yeah. You know. The heart of the message is probably correct. You don't want to be that person, but the the rationale for even purporting that message, I mean, the whole Kitty Genovese thing was fabricated without any kind of source or real evidence. It's just a good fictional story. It's It's an allegorical tale. You got it. And then, you know, act of natures will never understand. Scientists will write something for the books, but in the end, it'll be just the theory. Science is all, it's all mumbo jumbo politics, man. I don't want to pander to our audience, but I think they're scientifically literate enough to understand that all of science, everything we know about reality, we call a theory because it is testable and we are willing right. to decide on something else if it turns out not to be correct. Science isn't made up to pacify people. Yeah, right. You can't do that. No. You can't say, oh, this is, it's not fucking Grecian times. We're not <laughs> right. explaining the thunder it's not or sun Apollo guns. pulling the sun right. across the sky. You have to test it. It has to be provable. It's peer edited. Science cannot be done to pacify people. That's what religion's for. And then there's the mood ring thing. And I want to cover this uh, briefly because it's really, you know, it's really poppy, but we may never get another instance to mention it. Uh, Mark Wahlberg's character talks about cameras that capture auras. And this is a thing people believe actually exists. Like mood rings, everybody but M. Night Shyamalan knows that that's nonsense. But there's a lot of people who think that th this camera, I guess it's a um, Curlian camera. I've never used one. I yeah. don't actually know how to pronounce that. Curlian it's camera. It's K-R-L-I-A-N. Yep, sounds about right. It's a voltage camera. You take a photo with it, and it shows a sort of hazy aura around the subject. And that aura can be, um, I say that in scare quotes, aura, can be different colors. One hypothesis going forward is that the color changes from photo to photo depending on several variables, but mostly moisture. Science can test this, right? Moisture, all right? So if we take the photo in a vacuum, you may speculate, you may hypothesize that you would have no aura, right? Because no moisture, we're in a vacuum, which turns out to be exactly what happens when you use that fucking camera and take a picture in a vacuum with no moisture. Hmm. Mind freak. The one lingering question here is, uh, and this is the one that bothered me for months after I saw the film, how did a film this bad come to be? Now, we have a couple actors in here, Mark Wahlberg, I've mentioned a million times, and John Leguizamo, and even Zoe Deschanel. I'm not going to say any of them are great actors for two reasons. One, I don't personally feel they're great actors, and two, as we've already mentioned, we don't know anything about actors. Not a thing. But I don't think they're the three worst actors on the face of the earth. Probably true. Would you, you agree that's with that? That's probably true. Yeah. I don't even think they're the three worst actors we saw today. That's Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Nor even the three worst actors in The Happening. That's true. However, in the movie The Happening, they do appear to be the three worst actors on the face of planet fucking earth. That's true. How, Michael? How does this come to be? How do these people... We've seen Mark Wahlberg in Good Stuff. You don't see him in Boogie Nights and go, this is a good movie, it's except true. for that asshole who's ruining it, like true. you do in The Happening. Every time he shows up, he talks to the plastic plant, which is my favorite scene of anything that's, that's ever been created. You know, every time he opens his mouth, you go, this actor is the one ruining the film. And then we see poor little Zoe Deschanel, who I've seen in other stuff. She even tried to make that Tin Man thing on the sci-fi channel better. Yeah. Usually I see a movie and I go, well, Zoe Deschanel, I don't know anything about acting, but she's got a little bit of charm. And that's enough to work for me personally. That's not what's going on in this film. And then fucking John Leguizamo, who is probably the most legitimate of sure, the three he's actors. he's absolutely the most legitimate. I've but seen him in shit films that are good because of him. Unfortunately, his, his all the lines in his script are just numbers. Yeah. He doesn't have lines. I mean, my idea after I saw the movie the first time was perhaps they shot this movie and perhaps to make it edgier, they used the single worst take of every scene. Because I thought there's no way that these actors could be performing so poorly. And so this is where that question starts to come up. Does the director control his actors to the extent? I mean, what is it? it does it happen through editing? Is it the script? At what point does this movie become shit? Is, I guess, really the no, question I I'm think, asking. No, I think that the idea is definitely a good one. I think uh, we talked about it. We picked a bunch of different directors. Jack Starrett, Jack Hill, Alex Aha were all kind of thrown out there and because we have this couch and all we do is talk about directors we like right but i think that the script was probably salvageable too i'm going to conjecture that perhaps m night Shyamalan was worried that his protagonists would outact his antagonists wow that is brilliant that is fucking brilliant i guess i'm just gonna say that m night Shyamalan asked mark Wahlberg to do the entire 
movie in a falsetto for some reason. The way he talks, everything he says, it's it's as if they're doing a spoof. That's how I felt about, you know, even watching The Room. It seems like Mark Wahlberg is in a glorified SNL sketch, although we know what those look like because they get made into fucking movies. I don't understand, Michael, how a movie this bad got made by a professional crew. Somebody, unlike The Room, where anybody could have ruined it at any point, someone could have fixed the happening at any point. I just think it's one of those events in Hollywood we'll never fully God, understand. I hate you. Never fully understand. Or perhaps your alternate ending would have made it better. Okay, so I had this idea that... This is great, by the way. I love this. Particularly the scene at the end of the film where it shows the two of them kind of crossing the field and coming face to face. Three of them, but that little thing I don't count. Um, there's this moment that I... I, I, my heart was in my throat in the theater where I thought they were going to get... You're talking about when they walk in from each side. Right. Um, There's the scene where it shows the field mm -hmm. at the old woman's property and they walk in from either side of the screen. Sure. Mark Wahlberg and Zoe Deschanel. And they get closer and closer. They're walking up to each other. And I thought, now they're just going to start walking backwards and the film will end. Oh, man. They'll just walk backwards right back out of the frame and then it will, you know, I mean, you know, probably since it's M. Night Shyamalan, say M. Night Shyamalan's The Happening or M. Night Shyamalan and then in quotes, yeah, I did that or something like that. You know what I love about that ending? It's the perfect balance of bullshit ending the movie would have come up with. It's just bad enough for me to believe The Happening would do it, but better than any single thing that happens in The Happening. Right. It's the Inception thing, mm -hmm. right? It's that fucking bullshit you see what I did there ending, oh, which so is the type of ending this movie has to have, but it's the best way it could have done that. Okay, so now we have, this is this is chapter three for you chapter users. You have successfully found chapter three. I think it's actually going to come up as chapter four. I don't know how chapters work. You've never downloaded our show, have you? The thing about this section is, is, I think what we're really going to touch on is what we talked about in the intro, which is, why is the room good? Why is the <laughs> happening bad? When both are bad. Exactly. We've discovered a lot of things through our conversation that I didn't think would come up. So if you decided that you were going to watch one of the movies and you skipped over that, maybe go back and listen to it anyways, because there really weren't any spoilers That's in there. That's true. I'm not even spoilers that people who care about spoilers would think are spoilers. Wow. So I think the big question for me comes down to the filmmakers. Mm -hmm. I think the real point to be made, and I, and I want to be very honest with this right off the bat, I am abundantly aware that both filmmakers are just jerking off. It's self-serving. The whole time. Sure, I was thinking the same thing. And that was one of the things that made the question even more intriguing. Because both movies, I would have just said, oh, one's self-serving, and that's why people hate it, because people hate fucking... Especially when something is uh, thinks it's really, really good, and it's only kind of good. It's not nearly right. the level it thinks it is. Fuck that shit. But both of these movies are like that. M. Night Shyamalan, while not appearing in this film... False. Uh, <laughs> he's not appearing, but his voice is on the cell phone. He's not the thing that's on display, like Tommy is. But I think you would agree the films are almost equally self-serving. Uh, just because everything M. Night Shyamalan does is, look at me, I'm such a genius. Self Have you seen the, uh, the documentary that was made about M. Night Shyamalan? No. So he perpetrated this hoax, and I guess we'll probably never do an M. Night Shyamalan film, so this is a really great point to talk about this. He perpetrated a hoax um, documentary, a faux documentary that aired, I don't even give a shit what channel it was, but right around when, um, I don't know, Signs or The Village, probably The Village was coming out, about him as a filmmaker. It was a documentary about who is M. Night Shyamalan. And uh, the documentary went on to describe all of these surreal events that had happened in his life and how he drowned as a kid but was miraculously saved. And so he has a weird thing about water he puts in his movies. And how there's a there's this bird that follows around the documentary crew. And so the documentary gets a little bit meta, kind of talking about like what's going on with the crew. And it made itself to look like an absolutely genuine documentary and was only later found out to be a big piece of shit that M. Night Shyamalan created about himself. And so ever since seeing that, I just get this feeling that everything he does, he sits at home and goes, I am so enigmatic. I am such yeah. a clever fucking dude. Whereas with Tommy Wiseau, he put himself out there. Mm -hmm. He puts himself in the film. He's the star. He's, he's just overconfident. And he's there to be made fun of. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows who they're laughing at. And he's kind of a laughing stock. M. Right. Night Shyamalan sits in the chair with his finger over his top lip. 
and his his fist to his chin. Sure. And his his brow furrowed while he's kind You're of making a really great M. Night Shyamalan face right now. I wish the people scene could see it. unfold in front of him right. that he's created. The mastery. In the Shyamalan world. Mm-hmm. Tommy was always like, yeah, say some lines. We'll have a good time. Everybody's at the party. Good thinking. All right. So it's not the self-serving nature. We, we can cross that off the list. Is it perhaps then the popularity? Because The Room was a movie that was not popular, whereas The Happening was very popular. So do you think maybe the popularity just turns people off? Could that be it? I think it's possible that maybe the so good it's bad comes from the acclaim. All right. The Happening was acclaimed before it came out. It's an M. Night Shyamalan film, big budget, summer blockbuster kind of film. The Room, the fans found and decided, this is funny. This is so bad it's good. Right. It's not the kind you you would never see a film in theaters aside from The Wicker Man mm-hmm. that would achieve so bad it's good status because people don't go to the theater for that kind of film. Sure. That kind of film in a theater, here maybe this is the definitive point right here. People pay nine dollars to see the room. Mm-hmm. People pay nine dollars to see the happening. One of those audiences is disappointed. All right. I see exactly what you're saying. You know, it's funny. That you said that because I wrote down nearly the same thing, although I wrote down in my notes here, um, the iPad literally says twelve dollars oh, because I'm sorry. I go to showplace right. <laughs> to see movies. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, when you see something like the room, you go because it's bad. You go because other people You're told not you in that yeah, you don't feel t- that's exactly what it is. Whereas you go to see the happening and you go because you think it's scary or enigmatic or for whatever reason, you think it might be something other than what it is, and it turns out to be awful. I mean, the real thing that gets me about it, and I don't know if this is the same for anybody else, is that the room is bad, but it ends when you leave the theater. That's right. The happening is harmful to humanity. It's actually insulting to Mm -hmm. you. Whereas you see something like the room, and Tommy's right on stage. So, you know, it's, it's what you were saying earlier. You can make fun of him right when he's there. Whereas M. Night Shyamalan is hiding behind his movie. And once the movie is over, you go out into humanity with this idea that's been thrown at you, this insulting, fucking offensive idea that's supposed to be self-deprecating, that's supposed to be about how we should save the earth. It wants you to feel motivated. And Tommy, at least these days, is just going, yeah, laugh at me while I'm on stage. That's fine. I don't really care. So I guess the first thing we should do before we talk about our uh, website, which is doublefeatureshow.com, and our email address, which is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com, before we mention those, Got we it. should talk about the fact that everybody came along for the ride this week. And if you didn't, it's totally fine. <laughs> sorry you watched shitty films. We're but really sorry to make you do that. We, we won't do that ever again on purpose. Agreed. Except maybe Killapaloozas. We still have one more of those this year, right? True statement. But not next week. Next week, we're going to do two good films. We're going to reward everybody for their wonderful yeah. behavior. And we're going to get back to uh, some kind of splat packy stuff. Oh, yeah. We're going to do the remaining splat pack films, really. So this is kind of combining the We Need to Learn More show mm-hmm. with the Oh Cool Splat show. Absolutely. In a We Need to Learn More About Oh Cool Splat show. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's going to be that's the title. I think the actual title is High Tension. And something called Wolf Creek. Right, Wolf Creek being the uh, final Australian Splat Pack member. Yes, the man we haven't got to. And High Tension being a movie we've just avoided for so right. long. That's that an needs, Alex Aha film. Yeah, it needs to be covered uh, on the show. So until next time, I guess that leaves us with... Watch more fucking film? Bye.